Okay. Uh, hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. Uh, I'm Justin Esri. I'm an assistant professor at Rice University. Uh, the International Methods Colloquium is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion of the application of quantitative statistical methods to the social sciences, sponsored by Rice University and by the National Science Foundation. Uh, this week's speaker is uh, Gary King from Harvard University. Welcome, Gary. Uh, his talk is entitled, uh, Why Propensity Scores Should Not Be Used for Matching. Uh, so the talk will last between 30 and 40 minutes, uh, after which point we'll take questions from the audience, so there'll be about 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, you can call in to ask a question on the air at our toll-free call-in line, which is 1-855-667-8287. That's 1-855-NO-STATS, uh, ironically. Uh, they, you can email, also email questions to methods.colloquium at gmail.com. Finally, you can ask a question using the GoToWebinar Ask Question box that appears on the GoToWebinar control panel on, on your screen. Uh, for our viewers outside the United States, we recommend using the Ask Question box to ensure that we receive your questions promptly. Uh, a copy of the paper slideshow that goes along with this presentation is available in the uh, paper and slideshow that go along with this presentation is available in the handout box in your GoToWebinar window. Uh, now, I'd like to welcome Gary to the IMC. Welcome, Gary. Thanks very much, Justin. Uh, it's pretty amazing what you guys are doing, and I'm um, happy to be here. Hi, everybody. I'm not sure why I can't hear you all, but uh, it's such a case. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, why propensity scores should not be used for matching, and really it's a general talk about matching in general and the most popular used methods, which, which is propensity scores. Uh, the, the bottom line is you shouldn't do propensity score matching, but you certainly should do matching. Uh, Rich Nielsen from MIT and I wrote, wrote the paper that's behind this, uh, this talk. You can find the paper, I guess, on GoToMeeting or on my website, or on either of our websites. Okay, so let's um, show you where, where, let's start in here. Um, uh, with the scholarly influence of propensity score matching, um, uh, it's the most commonly used matching method by far. Uh, if you go to Google Scholar, it has 49,600 uh, articles there, although I'm not quite sure about that metric because over time that number goes up and also down sometimes, so I don't really know what it is. I think uh, instead of 49,600, it should just say a lot. Um, Pearl calls it the most developed and popular strategy for causal analysis and observational studies. Uh, this paper is about propensity score matching and, and other kinds of matching. It, it, it's, it's about matching as used in practice. Uh, not implicated by our results are other uses of propensity scores. Uh, regression adjustment, inverse weighting, stratification, propensity scores used inside other methods, or even the mathematical theorems about propensity scores, all of which are right. Propensity scores, it turns out, have lots of terrific uses. Matching happens not to be one of them, as we'll, as we'll show you today. Um, so, uh, what do we? What, what is matching? Matching. The goal of matching is to reduce model dependence. So let me convey to you what model dependence is with a graph from this paper in 2007. Uh, although I've made a sort of dynamic version of it. So on the horizontal axis here we have education, which is just a control variable, and the vertical axis is some outcome variable, conveniently labeled outcome. Uh, and then the causal variable is the treatment units versus the control units. So I have the, the treatment in, in red T's and the controls in blue C's. And the goal is to figure out the effect of that binary causal variable on the outcome holding constant education. Um, and so how would we normally do that? Normally we'd run a regression of the outcome on the binary variable, that's the key causal variable that we want to know the effect of, that's C versus T, and controlling for education. If you run that regression, this is what you get. You get, you get um, a straight line uh, which jumps up only for the causal effect. So what's the causal effect? It goes, from, uh, it goes from blue control up to red for treatment. So the effect is positive. That's basically what you have. Now, let's suppose that's a problem because actually you wanted it to be negative. What do you do? What's a, what's a data analyst to do? One thing you could do is say, well, notice that it doesn't really fit very well, and so maybe we should add, a, add make it a quadratic term. So now we'll run a regression of the outcome variable on treatment versus control as our main causal binary variable, uh, education as we did before, but also education squared. 
So what happens now? So now the causal effect, instead of going from blue up to red, now you can see the, the quadratic there, it goes from blue down to red, right? So now the causal effect is negative. And so being completely sarcastic, this is very convenient for the analyst because you can choose the causal effect just, as, just by choosing the specification. Obviously, this is a huge problem. This is the definition of model dependence. Small changes in the specification produce big changes in the substantive results. And this is just a vivid, vivid example of this. But you all know that this happens. You know, after you're done running your, collecting your data and typing it in and getting it all ready and you're, you're, in your, you're in your office or your dorm room or whatever it is and there's one light over your head and the door is closed and you run your analysis, after collecting data for two years, are you done running your analysis? No, of course. You, you, you run it with different time periods and you delete outliers and you do all kinds of things. Model dependence is the variation in your causal effects across all of those, all of those results. And that's really a problem. Okay, so let me, let's see what we can do about that. So one thing we can do about that is go back to the data set, run matching. What's matching? Matching is basically pruning. So what is pruning? Pruning just deletes some observations. Matching, I think, should have been called pruning because that's really what it does. It just deletes some observations in a very specific way that we'll, descri we'll describe later. In this case, it deletes these, uh, these control units. So you delete those control units. It prunes those off. You now rerun the linear regression, and this is what you get. So now the linear regression shows that there's basically no causal effect because the blue line is almost on top of the red line, and there's not much of a shift from one to the other. But the key, the key point here is suppose we run the quadratic which, as it turns out, is also plotted already on the graph without me having to click anything. Because right there, you can see that also the causal effects for the quadratic is basically the same. They're all plotted on top of one another. They're giving the same results. The fundamental point here is it does not matter in the match data whether you uh, run an analysis based, based upon using a linear regression or a quadratic regression. That, that model dependence has gone away and now you're going to get the same results regardless. If we're reading an article, we would certainly like data to have been matched so that the model dependence goes away. And this is an example of the benefits that matching can give you. Uh, gives you a lot more confidence in the kinds of results you would have. Okay, so let's be more specific. What, what are the problems that matching solves? Well, without matching, you have imbalance. So what is that? That's when you you have an analysis where, the, let's say, the binary variable is some medicine we're going to give people, and you happen to give the medicine just to the, just to the healthy people, and you don't give the medicine to the unhealthy people. Obviously, that's a huge control variable, how healthy they are if the outcome is, I don't know, longevity or something. And so you really want to pay attention to it. So imbalance is what matching is trying to get rid of. It's trying to get rid of the control variables, or in particular, the relationship between the control variables and the key causal variables. What does imbalance do? Imbalance is the, the source of model dependence. When there is imbalance, that means that if you specify the, the regression or whatever model you're going to run to estimate your causal effects in different ways, you'll get different answers. That's model dependence. Model dependence, what does that do? That leads to researcher discretion. When the researcher has lots of discretion, we know the consequence of that. We know from an enormous amount of research in social psychology that we will inadvertently or perhaps intentionally bias things in our, in our favor. Um, no, no matter how hard we try otherwise, the results of research of imbalance, model discretion, and uh, excuse me, um, imbalance, model dependence, and research of discretion will lead to bias. So let's look at that more specifically. Even if we had a whole lot of unbiased estimates and we make a qualitative choice based upon the outcome, that's a biased estimator. Let me, let me make that more specific. Suppose we had 50 pristine randomized experiments. Randomized experiments so that everything was done right. But there are 50 different sets of data randomly drawn from exactly the same population. Every one of those is unbiased, judged ex ante, ahead of time. However, suppose we run the 50 experiments and the estimator is the choice of one of them. We choose one based upon the results, like let's say the largest results. What's the consequence then? Well, the consequence, the consequence then is that we have a biased answer, okay? Because, because um, a qualitative choice from unbiased estimates produces a biased estimator. 
Um, in fact, if you use uh, the, uh, the social scientist's favorite um, uh, explanation for why they're doing things, it's plausible, then it's probably worse, right? So our, whatever kinds of judgment we use in those situations to choose among things that ex ante may be unbiased, but um, nevertheless using the outcome, we can, we can make it worse. Okay, well, suppose we put in a lot of effort and we really try to make it not biased. After all, we're all serious scientists here, right? Suppose we just try hard. Well, as it happens, conscientious effort does not avoid biases. This is uh, effort, uh, this is um, evidence from social psychology where there's, there's quite a lot of really good experiments where people try to work very hard to reduce their biases and it does not happen. It does not work by just trying hard. And the reason why is because people just don't have access to the, to the mental processes to, to avoid the problem. You need, in order to learn, you need feedback. If you take your finger and you touch it to the stove, even if you're two years old, you learn extremely fast that you don't want to do that again. If, however, you're trying to avoid uh, things that you don't have feedback on, then you're not going to improve. And it's very difficult to know when we're biased and when we're not biased. Okay, let's take that to the next level. Let's suppose we take an expert and have the expert try hard. Well, what, what happens then? Well, experts overestimate their ability to control their personal biases more than non-experts. And the most prominent experts are the most overconfident. So the real problem is like all of you and me, right? That's, that's the real problem. Okay, so wait, that's the experts. Suppose we take somebody who tries hard and we take but not just somebody, we take the experts, and we teach the experts about the biases that they're likely to create. Well, as Nobel Prize winning psychologist Danny Kahneman said about this kind of situation, teaching psychology is mostly a waste of time. I don't think he meant that in general, but in this regard it is. Uh, and so you can't get out of bias when there is researcher discretion. I think we just know that as social scientists. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to try to deal with this statistically. Uh, with matching, what, what, what is the consequence? With matching, we're going to get rid of imbalance. We'll have balance. Once you have balance, you'll get rid of model dependence, researcher discretion, and, and bias. Um, in fact, this goes along with what is a long-term central project of the whole field of statistics, which is pretty, pretty much automating away human discretion when possible. It's, a, it's an interesting balancing act. We always want to use as much information as people actually have, but not use the, the um, biases and other kinds of in, inadvertent things that, that humans let get in. Um, okay, so let's go into the details here. What's matching? So in matching, we're going to have a basic setup here in, a, in the simplest possible case, a dependent variable, why? a treatment variable, which is our key causal variable, and it's going to be binary. We're going to call uh, the ones treated and the zeros controls. Um, you could, they could be um, anything you want, but it's, it's a binary variable. And then we'll have a whole bunch of pretreatment confounders or covariates. They're control variables. And that's, that's the X's. This is the simplest setup. We can generalize this. T, in fact, can have more than two categories. It can actually, in certain cases, be continuous. But let's just focus on the simplest case so that we really understand what we're doing. Uh, so we have Y is the dependent variable, T is the treatment, and X is a whole list of, of control variables. Um, so now we're going to look at what's the thing that we want. What we want is the treatment effect for treated observation I, for treated observation I. So this is the treatment effect, TE, treatment effect. And the treatment effect is going to be defined as the value of Y if it were treated, which in fact it is, that's a 1. Uh, minus the value for that one person um, uh, if, in fact, that person were not treated. So the thing about this is that the first one is unobserved, the second one is observed. In fact, we can take the first one and get rid of that one there. Uh, so the, we, it's really just clear that that's the value we have. And the treatment effect, the causal effect for that one person, is the observed value minus the value that would have been the case if the treatment had not been applied to that person. So obviously that's not observed because this is, a treat, this is a treated unit. So what do we do? What matching does is it says, let's estimate the unobserved thing 
with another observation that is very much alike the observation that we're studying. In fact, it, it, it matches on all of the control variables. We'd like to match exactly on all the control variables, but if we can't match exactly, we'll match uh, very well if possible. And we'll just take the outcome variable uh, value, which is uh, y sub j on the slide here, and we'll just substitute it in, and that's one way of estimating the treatment effect. Um, obviously, this all depends upon choosing the correct confounder, confounding variables uh, so that you can control away, control away any, any bias. Um, from this, we would not usually estimate the quantity of interest for each person. We would estimate an average. So the sample average treatment effect on the treated, or SAT, is the mean of the treatment effects over all the treated units. You could do it over all the units, but for matching, this is a convenient, convenient way of doing it. Sometimes we would also prune some of the treated units that are just really badly matched, and we would estimate not SAT, but a feasible SAT. Right, a SAT for which we had good matches. That actually changes the quantity of interest, but that, that's okay. This is observational data analysis. Um, that's what we do in observational data analysis. Uh, the great thing about matching is it's incredibly convenient from a data analytic perspective. You don't have to change all the procedures that you have for doing data analysis. Because basically, uh, what you do is you think of matching as pre-processing. You take your data, you match in a particular way, that prunes some of the observations. It produces a matched data set that you then analyze any way that you were going to analyze it previously. If you were going to run a regression, you still run a regression. If you were going to run uh, two stage least squares, you run two stage least squares. If you're going to run a big logit, you run, you run a big logit. Whatever you were going to do previously, it will just work better. That's all. So you just pre process your data with matching and you, and you go ahead. Um, pruning matches. Uh, pruning non-matches, excuse me, uh, makes the control variables matter less. It breaks the link between the treatment variable and, and all the X variables. It reduces imbalance, reduces model dependence, cuts researcher discretion, and eliminates a lot of the bias. So that's, the, that's what matching is about. Uh, another way to think about matching is it's finding randomized experiments hidden in observational data. Ideally, we would love to be able to randomly assign things to different observations, uh, but you know we can't always do this in in, um, in 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 the social sciences. My next door neighbor in graduate school at the University of Wisconsin studied meat science. Meat science. He had cows that were genetically identical. He knew everything going in and everything going out. And I had uh, I was studying members of Congress, thinking that that would be a really great experiment to run. But it's a little harder to randomly assign things to member of con members of Congress, although sometimes we can do stuff like that. Anyway, um, so uh, get my slides to work here. So <clears throat> if we're going to find hidden experiments inside our observational data and prune away the rest of the observations, we need to pay attention to the types of experiments that we could find. And then it turns out this distinction between different types of experiments is crucial. As it happens, if you're doing experimental work, it is also crucial there. Choosing the right type of experiment can make a big difference. Let me talk about two types of experiments. First is complete randomization, which is probably the classic uh, experimental design. You flip coins, and heads you assign the person to treatment, and tails you assign the person to control. So it's, it's quite straightforward. An alternative is a fully blocked experiment. A fully blocked experiment, you take the observations, you measure X on them, so you have some idea of what they are, who they are, what they're about, and you match them, let's say in pairs or in, or in larger groups, and you match them as, as well as possible on the observed background characteristics. And then within each group, let's say the groups are pairs, you flip one coin for each of the, the um, for each of the pairs, heads, this person gets it, this person doesn't, tails, this person gets it, and this person doesn't. So what's the difference between these two? The goal of experiments and of our observational matching analysis is to balance the covariates. Well, there's two kinds of covariates. There's observed covariates, the ones you think to measure and you actually do measure, and there's unobserved covariates. Um, complete randomization balances between the treatment and control groups the observed var variables on average. It doesn't balance them exactly on sample, but it balances them on average. The amazingly cool thing about randomization is it also balances the unobserved variables that you either didn't observe or didn't even think to measure. It balances those on average too because the difference between the units in the control group and the treatment group 
differ only on only at random, and therefore on average they're the same. Well, let's compare complete randomization to a fully blocked experiment. The key difference is that since we measured some of the variables and we blocked on them exactly, we will exactly balance those variables, not on average, but in your data, exactly, exactly balanced. Same, say, we'll have the same results for unobserved variables because you're flipping the coin. On average, you'll be balanced. So this is a very big difference between these two types of experiments. Um, if you're running experiments, a fully blocked experiment dominates complete randomization for imbalance, does better with respect to imbalance, model dependence, power, efficiency, bias, the cost of your research, um, literally how long you're going to be in the field. If you are designing an experiment, you don't have to go to whatever uncomfortable place you're going to go and spend as much money as you're going to spend if you run a fully blocked rather than randomized experiment. It really matters, the difference here. It's also a lot, a lot more robust. Uh, in this paper that we cite here, uh, we were able to calculate the difference in standard errors if you chose a random, completely randomized experiment versus a fully blocked experiment. And you can get standard errors that are 600% smaller. So it really matters a lot to choose one versus the other. Okay, but that's experimental research. We're doing observational research in which we're going to approximate the experiment by looking for a particular type of experiment hidden in observational data. So what are the goals of the different methods? PSM, which is going to be my abbreviation for propensity score matching. So propensity score matching attempts to find in a uh, observational data set a completely randomized experiment. Pretty much all other methods of matching search for a fully blocked experiment. So that means other methods of matching, if they succeed in finding the experiment that they want, will dominate PSM. And that's pretty general. In fact, actually, it gets worse than this, and because there's, there's more to it than this. But right now, this means that PSM has lower standards for its goal than other methods. Okay, so in order to put this in context and to give you some other sense of what, what matching is, uh, let's talk about three methods of matching. The third will be propensity score matching. So uh, first one is Mahalanobis distance matching. It approximates a fully blocked experiment, not complete randomization, the better fully blocked experiment. Um, and the general procedure is we're going to start off by pre-processing our data, and then, we're, and then after you pre-process your data and you get rid of the, some of, prune some of the observations, we will uh, run subtype, some type of estimation procedure. We could run a regression or um, refried least squares or whatever it is you want. And um, after that, or take just a difference in means, that's your estimation step. Okay, so how does matching work in this case? Well, first of all, we have to measure the distance between one observation and another observation. And we understand what an observation is based upon the values on each of the uh, covariates. So, uh, so, it, so here we have a distance equation, which is the Mahalanobis distance between uh, a treated unit uh, X sub C and a control unit, um, excuse me, a control unit uh, X sub C and a treated unit X sub T. Uh, this S in here is, a, is the standardization. So you basically standardize all the variables and take the Euclidean distance between the, the two observations. Just to be clear here, Mahalanobis distance is for methodologists. If you're actually running a real application, you should use Euclidean distance and scale the variables the way you want. Don't let some statistician or methodologist tell you that you should standardize your variables and the standardized variable is what conveys the meaning. Actually, the point of standardization is to make your data invariant to the substance, which is not a good thing. In fact, it's basically to make your data invariant to you and everything you know. So you don't really want to do that. But in any event, I'm going to proceed here because I'm talking about the methods rather than the, a particular example. Um, we're, they going to we're going to match each treated unit to the nearest control, where nearest is defined in the way that we just uh, defined distance. Um, in the simplest possible application, we're going to take control units, and we're not going to reuse them. We're going to prune them if, if, they're, if they're unused. Um, and we're going to, um, uh, we're, we will also throw out some extra uh, treated units if they have matches that are very bad. So there's other ways of doing this. There's all kinds of adjustments to this basic method, and you should feel free to um, uh, you know, use any of them, any of the adjustments, because the same arguments will apply here. 
Okay. So here's Mahalanobis distance matching. Education on the horizontal axis, age on the vertical axis. Both of these are control variables. We have uh, treated units and control units. We match the treated units to the nearest controls. Everything that doesn't get matched, it's like musical chairs. They drop out. Um, this, is, this is the rest. We drop out the, 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 the links. The links are not important. Um, uh, and then that's our data set for analysis. Let's, let's look at the best case. The best case for Mahalanobis distance matching is a terrific data set in which it's very densely populated and all the T's have C's really close to the, to the T's. And, and then when we do the match, we drop the ones that are gray here, uh, blue gray here, and we end up with this beautiful data set where every T is perfectly matched to a C and therefore our two control variables, education and age, have um, uh, no effect on, uh, on whether you're choosing a T or a C. You can control for education or age any way you like, it won't matter. You can put in cubic terms, square terms, you're going to get the same answer no matter what. So that's the best case for Mahalanobis distance. How about coarsened exact matching? Um, <clears throat> so this also approximates a fully blocked experiment. Um, it uh, begins with pre-processing on matching and, 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 and then there's estimation with some model or difference in means, same thing as Mahalanobis distance. <clears throat> you temporarily course in X as much as you're willing, so what does that mean? So if you had years of education, you could break that up into grade school, high school, college, or graduate school. That actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think you would rather group two college students rather than a, um, you know, a, a college dropout and a first year graduate student. Um, you then, um, uh, after coarsening, we would apply exact matching to the coarse index, uh, sort the observations into strata, each with unique values of the coarse index. Uh, you could prune any stratum that doesn't have both a treated and a control. Uh, and then you pass on the original units that, with their original values, you don't keep the coarsening, that's only for pruning and then uh, you pass those on to, to estimation. There's a little weighting that goes on in order to, because they may be more treated than controls or vice versa in one of the stratum. Um, I've written some papers on this. It's very simple, easy to understand, and very powerful. You can find them on my website. Um, so let's, let's look at what that looks like in practice. We have age uh, vertically and education, two control variables again. We then have to draw, we have to decide what the thresholds are, and instead of the real ones, we'll put some some that are extremely funny. Um, you can't hear anybody laughing, but that's only because you're separated from the rest of the audience. If you heard them, they would just be, they're just hysterical laughing at these jokes. Anyway, okay, so uh, education, high school, BA, MA, PhD, and then you, know, you break these up in relevant ways. Um, that then produces these strata. Um, the strata, some of the strata have treateds and controls. Those are the ones with the matches. Some only have controls, like out here. Those, will, those do not have matches. So we'll drop the ones that do not have both treated and control. Um, we'll also do a little weighting so that because in this, in this stratum, there's uh, a bunch of control units and only one treated. So you have to sort of make them equal. So the weight, there's a little very simple way to weight that will make them equal. Um, then you can get rid of the bins and this is basically our data set. Okay, let's look at um, concursion to exact matching again with the best case. So again, we have a terrifically dense data set where the treated units are near many controls. Um, now we have a very fine grid, so we didn't course in very much at all. Uh, we look closely at this and we're going to drop all the control units that are, uh, that, are not what, that are not matched to the treated units. And now again we have this, this beautiful data set where each treated unit and each control are at exactly the same point. Education and age have no impact on whether, whether you choose treated or control, no matter whether you control for them with squared terms or cube terms or quark ticks or whatever it is, they're not going to matter. There's not going to be any model dependence here. Okay. Last method is propensity score matching. So how does this work? Propensity score matching does not approximate the better fully blocked experiment. It approximates a completely randomized experiment, which is good. That would be great if you could do, but nowhere near as good as a fully blocked experiment. How does it work? Same sort of general story. You pre-process with matching, and then you do uh, estimation based upon a difference in means or a model. Uh, when you pre-process, uh, here's how this works. 
So first what we're going to do in propensity score matching is we're going to run a logit. There's other ways of doing this, but almost everybody does it this way. You run a, a logit, which is not the one that you're interested in, but it's a, si a side logit, an auxiliary logit, in which the treatment variable is temporarily the dependent variable, and all your control variables are your um, explanatory variables. So you run that, you run that logit, and you, and you plug in the values of x, multiply them by the estimated beta, and estimate this pi. So you have an estimated value of pi. That's the probability of treatment. Okay? And then you measure the distance from one observation to another only with respect to the difference between the control value and the treated value, just the absolute difference between those two. Um, you can match each treated unit to the nearest control in the same way as we did for Mahalanobis. Uh, the simplest version of this is, is that um, you don't reuse control units and you prune them if they're unused. Um, and we would also throw away any treated units that don't have uh, reasonably close matches. That's called the caliper. Um, there's many adjustments available to this basic method. You could match not in a greedy sense, but in an optimal sense. You could match one to one or one to two or one to three. None of that matters for the argument we have here, although it does matter in practice. Okay, so let's, let's have a look at what this looks like. Again, I have my age and education as my, my control variables. I have a data set uh, uh, composed of my, tr my treated and control units. First thing you do is you estimate the propensity score, which I have over on the right-hand side. We then project everything over to the right-hand side where we have our pies. So we estimate our pies on this vertical axis. We project them over. We forget the data. We just ignore the data for the moment. We match only on the propensity score dimension. So we're matching each treated unit to the nearest control, and we throw away anything that doesn't get matched in this game of musical chairs. We then project the ones that are, rema that are remaining back into the, into the original space. So I think you get the feel when we go back to here that we are throwing away information, because we start off with two dimensions and we end up, and we're, we're making decisions on one dimension. Okay, so let's look at the best case for propensity score matching. Again, we have this terrific data set where the treated units are near all the control units, um, or, near, or near some control units. We take the data, and what do we do with them? Well, we estimate the propensity score. Let's imagine that the propensity score in this case all match exactly. So it's the perfect case from the perspective of the propensity score. So let's suppose they're all 0.25. We project them all to the same point on the propensity score. What happens then? Well, they're all 0.25, so which, unit, which control unit does each treated unit match to? Which control unit does each treated unit match to? They're all 0.25, so the distance between each treated unit and any one of the control units is the same as any other control unit. So therefore, the only way to prune is essentially at random. In fact, it is at random with probability 0.25. So if you start off with a data set like this, and they all have propensity scores at 0.5. What happens then if you prune at random? You get a data set that looks like this. Okay. Now there's no systematic difference between this data set, but there's a lot of information left on the table. This treated unit is not on top of these controls. It's far from these controls. This treated unit is, is far. So there's a lot left on the table. That's the, that's the main thing here. Propensity score matching is suboptimal in this way. This is what it looks like if you flipped coins to decide whether each unit would be treated or controlled. And that is, it's just like a completely randomized experiment, not a fully blocked experiment. Okay, so what's the problem with that? Well, the interesting problem is that when you have a, a best case for propensity score matching, you're pruning at random. And then the strange thing, the surprising thing, is that random pruning is not innocuous. Random pruning, which propensity score matching does, increases imbalance. It increases imbalance. I was surprised about this. Um, in fact, I wrote in print at one point the opposite. Uh, so, in fact, this is true, which, which we showed. Dele and the basic story is, it makes sense once you think about it, deleting data only helps if you're really careful. Normally, more data is better. Okay, so let's, let's, ex let's define this. Random pruning. Um, uh, is, pr is, a, is when the pruning process is independent of the explanatory variables. That's the definition of random pruning. Here's a discrete example. Uh, suppose we have a data set that's perfectly balanced on sex. So we have two treated units, one male and one, one female, two control units, one male and one female. Uh, then we're going to randomly prune 
one treated and one controlled from each of those. For, we're going to prune. Excuse me. We're going to prune one one treated and one control. There's a lot of there's four different ways of doing that, resulting in four possible data sets. We could prune a female from treated and a female from control. In which case, we end up with two males: male treated, male control. Perfect balance. We could prune a male from treated, a male from control. In which, in which case, we're left with a female treated and a female control. They're perfectly balanced. However, there's two other ways to prune. We could prune a female and a male, in which case we get an imbalanced data set, or a male and a female, and we get, we get an imbalanced data set. So that means you start off with perfect balance, you prune, and half the time you end up with more imbalance. So random pruning increases imbalance. Here's a continuous example. We have a data set. T is uh, 0 and 1. Suppose it's randomly, randomly assigned. X is any fixed variable. Uh, we have n units. Let's take as a measure of imbalance between the treated as and controls the squared difference in means between the treated and control units. We call that d squared. Um, well, the expected value of d squared is the variance of d. That's just the definition in this case. Um, the variance of d, or the variance of the difference in means, is proportional to 1 over n, right? Sigma squared over the uh, over n. So that mean, what does that mean? That means if you randomly prune n declines, your sample size declines because you've just thrown out observations. If your sample size declines, then your then imbalance actually increases. So random pruning increases imbalance in this con in this continuous example as well. This sounds a little surprising, but it's it's not actually if you think about it. If you have a, a room full of people and if you were all in the same room, I would say, how far are you from the nearest person? Now imagine we uh, we remove. We ask half of you randomly selected to leave the room, and then uh, then I ask, how far is each of you from the nearest person? Actually, you would be farther away. So random pruning actually increases in balance. What's the consequence of that? Okay, so PSM, propensity score matching, statistical properties. First of all, it has low standards. Sometimes it helps, but it never optimizes. So it's efficient relative to complete randomization, because that's what it's shooting for. <clears throat> but it is inefficient, that is, the variance is not as low as it could be, relative to the more powerful full blocking. Other methods dominate. What are other methods shooting for? Other methods are trying to match uh, the, the um, treated and control variables exactly. If they do match exactly, then that actually implies that the, that the propensity scores match exactly. However, if you start with the propensity scores here and you match them exactly, that doesn't mean that you're going to get exact matching on the control variables. That's some of the examples I've showed you before. So other methods definitely dominate PSM. Uh, so first is low standards. Second is there's a PSM paradox, which I'm going to introduce to you now. And the, the basic story is when you do better, you do worse. Let me explain what that means. When propensity score matching approximates complete randomization, which it might to begin with if you had a really good data set, or it would as you started pruning observations, uh, eventually you would get closer and closer to complete randomization. When PSM approximates complete randomization, all the pies, all the propensity scores, are around 0.5 or constant within strata. Right? In, in, in the visual example I gave you, all the pies were close to 0.25. Um, that's, pr that's pruning at random. Right? That's exactly pruning at random. Pruning at random produces imbalance, produces inefficiency, which produces model dependence, which produces bias. Okay. So uh, if you have data, so the PSM paradox is as you get better and better, it will eventually start making things worse with propensity score matching. Um, if you crank up the caliper, if you crank up the caliper to be even stricter, to pay closer attention to the propensity scores, what will happen is that propensity score matching will, um, will do even worse. Um, suppose you have data with no good matches to begin with. At that point, the paradox won't kick in. So you'll run propensity score matching, and it will reduce imbalance. But you don't have any good matches, so you're sort of cooked anyway. Um, uh, so a lot of people will say propensity score matching is great because it solves the cursor dimensionality problem. I don't know how to match on 25 control variables, and I don't know what 25 dimensional space is. Let's just use PSM to project them down to one dimension and match on that. Doesn't it solve the cursor dimensionality problem? No, it does not solve the cursor dimensionality problem. The PSM paradox gets considerably worse as there's more covariates in higher dimensions. What if 
what if I match, as some people do, on a few important covariates, suppose you matched exactly, or, or with CEM, and then use uh, PSM? Well, then the lower standards will be raised some. So if you, use, if you use very important covariates, they'll be raised a lot. But then the paradox will kick in fast because you've already come close to the point of complete randomization. So PSM is not going to help you uh, anywhere near as much as other methods, and it might actually hurt you. Um, so let's, let's have a um, closer look at this with an example. PSM uh, in this example is blind where other methods can see. So here's an example data set. We created the following data set. Um, X1 and X2 on the two axes are two control variables. We start off in the lower right-hand corner in red, a completely randomized data set. So we randomly placed the Ts. Uh, we randomly placed a bunch of observations, flipped coins for whether each one should be T versus C. Um, so, that's, that, so this is complete randomization. Up in blue in the top right, this is a matched pair or fully blocked randomization. For this case, we took a bunch of Ts and we uh, uh, matched them on X1 and X2 with Cs. Uh, and then the flip of the coin was only to decide within each pair which one was T and which one was C. So this is a fully blocked experiment, which is better than a completely randomized experiment. Then to hide these in an observational data set, we threw in these control units. So together, this whole thing is imbalanced, but we have one good completely randomized experiment, one good uh, um, matched pair experiment. Okay. So what, does, um, what, what happens when we analyze these data? Um, so what we did is we ran this analysis a thousand times. I'm just going to describe the first one, which is the set of pixels along the horizontal axis here. So just this first set of pixels. All right, so here's, here's what happens. With Mahalanobis distance, we're going to prune observations one by one. We're first going to prune the worst observation, then the next worst, then the next worst, then the next worst. What happens with Mahalanobis? First it prunes off the bad control units, all the black. They're color-coded color -coded here. Right? It prunes off the control units one by one, and then it knows to prune the, the completely randomized experiment, and then it finally turns to the blue um, uh, matched pair experiment. And I would normally ask, does everybody see? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, that's, so that's the point. It does what you would want, not only in the first uh, random sample of, of data, but in the second all the way through a thousand. Right, so that's why it looks like three bars here. It's doing what you would want. It pulls off the worst one, then the next worst, leaving you with the best possible experiment. And, and it, it can prune within there, too. Okay, what happens with propensity score matching? It also finds the worst matches. It also prunes the black ones first, the control units far from everything else. However, and this is the key point, it is blind to the, di to the difference between a completely randomized experiment and a fully blocked experiment. That's, what, that's why the blue and the red is just um, uh, randomly distributed here. It can't see the difference. It can't see that this is a much better experiment than this one. Okay. Let's, let's analyze the data in, a, in, in, in another way. So let's take data in which we have um, uh, X1 and X2. Uh, again, these are two pretreatment con control variables. Um, I'm going to I'm going to randomly draw blue uh, control units and put them in this square. I'm going to randomly draw uh, uh, pink or orange or whatever it is you see there, uh, treated units and put them in this square. And you see the middle overlapping square is a completely randomized experiment. So this is perfect from the perspective of propensity score matching. Um, uh, so we have the same data sets in both of these graphs. This is Mahalanobis distance matching. This is propensity score matching. For Mahalanobis, you can see based upon the darkness of the lines here, that the first units prunes, or the final matches, are the lightest ones. Which ones are they pruning first? The ones that are in the, in the outside here. Those are, those are the lightest ones. And the ones that are pruned last are the ones in the completely randomized experiment. What does propensity score matching do? Propensity score matching is blind to the closeness of observations that happens by chance, even though the data were generated via a completely randomized experiment in here. Propensity score matching does prune the ones on the outside. That's great. Uh, it prunes them first. But then in here, you can see these vertical lines. It just can't tell the difference. Okay. Let's, an let's analyze those data in a different way. First of all, I'm going to measure model dependence. How, do how am I going to do that? Well, we need a dependent variable to measure model dependence. So I'm going to calculate it in the following way. With, with, with data like these, but generated a whole lot of times, not just once, 
um, we're going to generate a Y by taking a treated unit, multiplying it by two, which is going to be the causal effect we're going to try to estimate, plus the two other variables, so they implicitly have coefficients of one. And this is our true, true uh, regression. Then we're going to run, we're going to simulate model dependence by running a whole lot of regressions. And we, in fact, we ran 512 regressions with these variables, and then the variables squared, x1 and x2 squared, and then the interactions, and then interactions with t and all kinds of other, other variables. We then estimate this too, uh, in all of them, and calculate the variance across them. That's the vertical axis here. What happens? Well, the uh, uh, model dependence at, uh, along the like, so model dependence is measured by the variance. That's the height of this: up, bad, down, good. And then what we do is we start with the original data set, which has this level of model dependence, the variation across those models. And then we start pruning. We prune the worst matched observation. Model dependence drops for both PSM and MDM. We prune the next worst observation. It keeps getting better and better. That's terrific. What happens? For MDM, it keeps going down and basically eliminates model dependence. For PSM, at some point, it hits the point where it approximates complete randomization, and then it starts making things worse. Now, this is totally nuts. What this means is, right, right when, you're at, right when you're, you hit the bottom here, this means that you're willing to sacrifice an observation and throw it away, and for your generosity, you are penalized because, in, because model dependence is increasing. Okay, let's go to the right-hand side here. On the right-hand side, all we did is uh, notice is, is we put the vertical axis here, uh, the truth. Now, what's what's the truth? Well, let's suppose that the truth. Well, sorry, we know what the truth is. The truth is two, right? And then we're gonna we're gonna simulate the situation in which an analyst would bias things in their favor, intentionally or inadvertently. And and how will we do that? Let's imagine that somebody chose the maximum among all the analyses they ran. Eh, maybe a little unfair, but not, not wildly ridiculous. Um, so if they choose the maximum and they run Mahalanobis, then as you prune observations, Mahalanobis distance matching will cause the bias to drop and eventually get closer and closer to the truth. And that's basically what happens here. With propensity score matching, as you get down to the bottom, the same bottom as is over here, eventually it starts veering away and getting farther and farther from the truth as you uh, clamp down and, and adhere to the standards of propensity score matching even better. So this is an example of an estimator that you would not want to use. Okay. Does it work in, in reality, in real data? Yes, it works in real data. Here's, here's our example. We have two examples, one from uh, uh, Steve Finkel et al. In, in the journal Politics, one from my uh, co-author Rich Nielsen et al. in the, in the AJPS. Um, here's the story. Let's take Finkel et al. The raw data have uh, no units pruned along the horizontal axis, and it has this level of imbalance on the vertical axis, so it's right here. If we prune randomly and average across different, different runs, imbalance will increase. That's the, the dotted line. What happens if we run Mahalanobis distance? Well, it actually drops, just as you would expect. The more you prune, the better it gets. Uh, the more you prune, the lower imbalance is. With CEM, it's the same thing. The more you prune, the lower imbalance is. What happens with propensity score matching? You start with the raw data, you jump to one-to-one -one propensity score matching, and if you look over here, it's actually slightly worse than the raw data. Then you prune more, and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. This triangle is the point in which uh, there's a quarter of a standard deviation of the propensity score, which some people have recommended, that's worse than the original. This is not a method that you should use. Uh, in these data, in Rich Nielsen's data, um, you start with the raw data, propensity score matching helps to begin with, and then as you clamp down the, the caliper and hold it to stricter standards, pro propensity score matching makes things worse very fast. So this, you, this thing is shooting for increasing imbalance, which makes no good sense for any, any data analysis, analyst. Okay, so some conclusions. Why propensity scores should not be used for matching? They have low standards. Sometimes they help, but they never optimize. And then there's the propensity score, score paradox. When you do better, as you approximate completely, a completely randomized experiment, you actually do worse. Some mistakes with PSM. Uh, if you're going to use PSM, 
Don't control for irrelevant covariates, as supporters of this technique recommend you do. Don't do that, because irrelevant covariates will make your propensity scores jump around more, be more random, generate more imbalance and more bias. Do not adjust for experimental data with propensity score matching, as the proponents of propensity score matching have often suggested. Experimental data or, or, or already approximate a completely randomized experiment. That would be a, a big mistake. Uh, some re-estimate the propensity score after eliminating non-common support. That will also cause problems. The one-quarter caliper on propensity score. The real mistake is actually not switching to other methods, which are simple, easier to understand, and much more powerful. Okay, a warning for any matching method, not only PSM. Pruning discards information. So you have to overcome that. Um, other methods can generate a paradox if you prune after full blocking. Okay, so this, this is possible. It's rare, but, but, but it's possible. Uh, if you're not doing positive good by deleting observations, you might be hurting yourself. So you should be careful of a method that is designed to throw away data. Matching methods are still very highly recommended. Um, they are very powerful. They can massively reduce model dependence and bias. Just choose one with higher standards. Um, so I'd be happy to take your questions. So you can find our papers and, uh, and software and uh, more information on our website. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much, Gary, for the presentation. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll, uh, Gary's available to take questions from the audience. Uh, you can call to ask on air at 1-855-667-8287. That's 1-855-NO-STATS. You can email questions to methods.colloquium at gmail.com, or you can use the question box uh, in the GoToWebinar uh, video, or uh, uh, whatchamacallit there. Uh, and we've got several questions that have already been asked. <clears throat> so I'll start uh, by asking a question from Yao Han. Uh, what are the similarities? Is there any sort of similarity in the um, lessons that you derive for using propensity scores for matching versus other uses of propensity scores, such as you know, extracting latent space, uh, 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 latent dimensions out of latent space models? So this paper is just about propensity score matching. Um, it seems like the problem that we've discovered is the connection, the particularly bad connection between propensity scores and matching. Um, so we don't have any results on anything else wrong with propensity scores. For example, if you do propensity score weighting, uh, or if you do weighting, you need a weight, which is actually a scalar, a, a number. And a propensity score is, a, is going to be the way to estimate that. There's no other way to you, you, to, to do it, you're going to have to reduce the dimensionality in, in, in some ways. Um, so, so there's plenty of other good uses of propensity score. Matching, it, matching is not one of them. Okay. I think it's uh, worth it's worth looking into some of these. Uh, we haven't done that. Maybe the maybe the caller could do that. Um, uh, Emma Uprichard says uh, she really liked your point about standardization, but I, I this leads to something I was asking. So you told us at the beginning of the talk that uh, we should try to automate procedures as much as possible. But then when you were talking about standardization, you said you shouldn't let some methodologist tell you how to standardize your data. And those two, uh, those two uh, recommendations seem to be somewhat in tension. So uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? It's an excellent point. So you want to uh, take away from the analyst anything that they don't know. But if they know something and can contribute something, then they should be doing that, not the statistician. Uh, Thomas Ball uh, asks, if you run a randomized control trial, so it's sort of a, the best kind of gold standard experiment, the units should be randomly drawn before the trials run. Uh, why is there any need to uh, match and prune a post hoc if, uh, if you've already had an RCT uh, as part of your design? So it's a good question, Tom. Um, ideally, if you're running a randomized experiment, you would do a matched pair experiment. You would think of all the variables to match on, you would match them exactly, so you would get perfect balance on those variables, and then you'd flip a coin within it. If you do that, then there's nothing to match after the fact. Sometimes, however, you can't do it. Uh, in medical trials, sometimes someone comes into the hospital with some kind of injury or some, some type of illness. You can't say, why don't you just wait around for a couple of months until someone comes in that looks like you, and then I'll flip a coin and, and, and randomize. And so sometimes uh, you're constrained from doing the right thing ahead of time, which is running a match pair experiment rather than a completely randomized experiment. In those instances, you basically have an observational data set that, that is better than that because at least ex ante it's unbiased, but ex post you would have this extra variance which could have led to bias. 
there's a question from uh, Fernando Jose de la Guardia. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, how does this critique of uh, propensity score matching fit into the debate in the early 2000s between uh, Heckman, Ichi, uh, Heckman, Ichimura, and Todd and um, the WABA? There's a WABA paper that responds to that. So how do your critiques, are they the same as Heckman and Ichimura and Todd, or they, how, do they, how do they match up with that? Uh, so early on, people were trying to figure out, well, well, if you don't have a randomized experiment, how close can you get to it? And there was worry about what I think we would now call model dependence, because people would run um, big structural equation models, which are basically you know, complicated regression models. And different people would get to different answers, and so you'd have lots of model dependence. Then along came folks that said, well, maybe we should do matching. Matching would reduce a lot of the model dependence. And they showed that you actually reduced a lot of the model dependence and got somewhat closer to the experimental result. Uh, however, they were, they were hindered. They were, they were crippled in their efforts to do it if they're using propensity score matching. So it turns out you can get much closer. Um, we've shown in, in our papers that even with some of the same examples that, that some of those folks ran, like the Wallon data, you can get very close to the, to, to the right answer. You can't always, of course. But um, but that that will that you, you the idea of matching the idea in those in those arguments was absolutely right. It's just you might as well use a better me method of matching. Um, so this is a, a, a somewhat uh, long question. I have to actually scroll to get it from Carolyn Rudder. Uh, the focus was on the number of observations thrown out. Uh, can you say anything about the fractions of observations thrown out? Uh, PS matching seems to do well when the fraction of points thrown out is relatively small. Is this an argument for one-to-many matching? Uh, uh, PS matching seems to do well when the fraction of points thrown. Oh, that's just repeating. Okay, yeah. So that's the question. Yeah. So I think in general you would want to do uh, one-to-many matching. There's no reason to throw away observations if you if you don't have to. Um, uh, the, the the questioner was asking about is it the number dropped, the number remaining, or the or the proportion dropped? And really, it's the number remaining that is relevant. If you start off with a million observations, I'd be perfectly happy to, to, to throw out 900,000 observations if I'm trying to estimate a quantity with, and, uh, that's a relatively simple quantity to estimate, and I have 100,000 observations, I'd probably get a very small standard error, and that'd probably be fine. Um, so it really depends upon what you're left with more than what you start with. Uh, I want to ask a question that I was thinking about during the talk. So you, you mentioned uh, that what what um, a course in exact matching uh, is designed to do is sort of try to detect uh, hidden randomized experiments that are present in observational data, which is a very uh, compelling goal, right? It would be great. It it, it almost promises uh, extracting uh, experiments out of observational data, which would be pretty much the holy grail of of inference. But uh, I'm thinking about uh, practical problems. Uh, so, like for example, if I'm thinking about health insurance, mm -hmm. uh, I want to I want to know you know how much uh, health insurance, the sort of quality of my health insurance changes my health care, my my the quality of my health and how much I spend on health care and whatever. The the real problem there is uh, it's possible that I'm buying better health insurance precisely because I think I'm going to utilize it more. Right, so it's it's actually an expectation of the dependent variable in some sense, the mm -hmm. spending or health outcomes that causes the treatment, and it it seems to me that that's one thing where a randomized experiment is really good at getting rid of that because I I have control over assignment, and and matching just can't do that because there's you can't block the right in other words you just can't block the right pathway, it's not it's that you can only really block confounding pathways. So am I, the first question is, am I wrong in that interpretation? And if I am, you know, sort of how, how is it accomplishing that? And if not, if I am correct, what are the limitations about matching in terms of extracting these hidden experiments? So let's, so, so let's think about endogeneity, which is the category of problems you're talking about. There's nothing in matching that really deals with endogeneity. There's nothing in any kind of structural equation model or regression model or parametric analysis that deals with endogeneity. You can uh, do things, uh, um, uh, even in matching, you can control for a better set of variables that conditional upon those variables have dealt with the selection problem. So you can try to do things like that. But if you have an endogeneity problem that you're convinced is an endogeneity problem if you were to say run a regression, and you add matching on top of that, that's probably a stretch. You know?
Okay, so so the I guess the answer here is the limitation is if you really believe you have simultaneity or endogeneity of some kind, you need to think about some other strategy. Yeah, I mean I think that's a very hard problem to begin with, like a really really hard problem, and you know uh, uh, it, it's not, it's not the kind of problem that that you want to deal with. Like as an analyst, you should try to pick a different problem, and then you <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, well, um, we're, we're at noon. I always try to end the, the talk promptly. So first I want to thank uh, Gary for, for coming today. It was a very interesting presentation. I, I hope everyone learned a lot. We had a great audience uh, turn out and lots of questions, more questions than we can answer. So thanks for being here. Uh, next week, I'm very excited to announce, same time, uh, noon Eastern, 11 Central, we'll have a job market roundtable on getting jobs inside and outside of academia for quantitatively oriented political scientists. So we'll be having, uh, uh, we'll be joined by Emily Ritter of UC Merced, uh, Jay Yonamine of Google, uh, Nathan Daneman of the Data, Ta Data Tactics Corporation, uh, Susan Smeltzer of NYU Law, uh, uh, Michael Malecki of Crunch.io, and Marianne Gallagher from the University of Georgia. So um, that's a, at this time of year, everyone's thinking about the job market. I think it would be a great conversation. Then there'll be ways of sort of, uh, uh, we'll be talking about not only getting academic jobs, but getting jobs uh, in, in the industry. Uh, go to our website, www.methods-colloquium.com for more details. Thank you very much, Gary, for your presentation. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Take okay. Care. Thanks a lot, and I hope to see you next week. <laughs>